I don't want you to give me eight dollars a pound just because you like me. I want you to give me eight dollars a pound because you know that this is good, better for your health. What has made me make that decision is learning how expensive marketing is. I think that what is most difficult is just the the added consistency of putting in the hours of just talking. Do you have the want? Like, can you go to three farmers markets, load, unload, dedicate half of your week? Will you still like farming after that? We're trying to now, even if it takes us five years of marketing work, right. to build up 20 families, 30 families, 40 families that want that. Okay, so you are Daniel Tosta, and this is Tosta Family Farm. So what do you have going on around here, and how did you get started? All right, we have free range uh, chicken eggs that we, that we raise, forest raised pork, grass finished lamb, and we're looking to get into some grass fed beef as well. And how did we get started? Well, we've always wanted a homestead, and we're fortunate enough to acquire a good bit of land, and so since we already had a passion with gardening and with homesteading, like we might as well try to make a, a full-time job out of it. Generate some income uh, doing what we like to do. How did you know you wanted a homestead? Did you have like a farming background or like a homesteading background or anything like that before you came here? Well, we were always really attracted to to having some land, being a little bit okay. more independent, freedom, feeling yeah. free. Okay. We're passionate about health a lot and the more we started learning about food supply, the more we, we knew that the only way to have food that had the quality that we wanted for us, for our health, is to grow it ourselves. Okay. And so it was about a little over 10 years ago, we started watching gardening channels on okay. YouTube. John, I guess this is John Kohler from Grow Your Greens, and he iterated a lot about the importance of soil health, and so we were, we were diving into learning about soil health, and that kind of led to permaculture, and then permaculture butted up against regenerative agriculture, Yeah. and it was just a rabbit hole that we never, we never really... Uh, got out of it. <laughs> it's hard, it's isn't it? Once you super, dive in, you're like, there's no way out. You can't unsee right. what you've seen. That's right. It's super interesting. Yeah. And then uh, it all ties into the healthier the soil is, the healthier the livestock are, the crops are, and the healthier the healthier we are as well. And it's not just people. It's uh, rural communities. It's societies, yeah. ecological systems, waterways, everything. It's just yeah. a better a better way to, to live. When you got here, then what did you start doing? Did you put up these fences? Or were they already here? Yeah, none of this fence, none of the fencing was here. Uh, the water lines weren't here. The, what was here was essentially the the barn, and um, it, it, even then it was a little, it was a lot different. The driver wasn't there, so it was pretty much the house and the barn, no fencing. So you what, put what, all that up? Yeah, we we put all all of this up. Uh, what was it like? It was it was it was incredible because we put our home up for sale on a whim. Yeah. On a whim, on hoping that we could that we could make it work and for a, a little bit of time there we were in this rental that was really really rough okay that was really rough the rental company did not inspect the home uh the way they said that they did before we moved in oh, no. and there was a bunch of stuff wrong with it it it, it was a, it was a nightmare essentially uh between things that were leaking and things that just weren't working and, and then we found this home See, it's all it's all blessings yeah. because I was able to use uh, everything that they that they broke on their side of the of of the deal to break my lease with the rental company mm. to get here and to kind of play chess. But it was a yeah. fight every step of the way. They they, they uh, you know threaten you with suing you for breaking the contract. I'm like, well, you guys broke it 18 ways already. Right. <laughs> oh, bring it on. And they just backed off it, in a very stressful period of time. Essentially, yeah. is what I'm what I'm trying to communicate. Yeah, it, was, it sounds it was like it. All an act of faith, really. Yeah. Just going for it, basically. It was, Did you ever feel during that time that like we sold our house on a whim? Now we're in this rental. Everything's going wrong. We can't find a property. Everything keeps getting pulled out from under our feet. We messed up. Like we shouldn't have oh, sold boy. our home. We should have sat still. Like, did you ever feel like that? Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. The pressure was thick uh, my wife is especially and she's great she's stuck she's always sticking by the crazy stuff that <laughs> that uh that i uh, kind of come up with but it was a couple of times she was like did we really like what are we doing here even since then we've had times with while being here by launching the farm where it's it has felt like we have bitten off way more than we can 
than we can handle. But it ends up being, oh, things, things pass and, and things tend to end up better. So yeah. things work out. I'm curious how that works a little bit because, I mean, I think everyone has those feelings, like kind of those fraudy feelings, I guess. But when you take such a big leap, a, a leap in yourself, a leap in something that hasn't been created yet, it's not like you changed jobs and went to a steady paycheck. Like you said you wanted to be full time here and that's a separate question, but how does, how does that play out where you're just like trying to trust yourself? Oh, uh, I think an advantage that we have, that I have from that is uh, I didn't grow up with a, a silver spoon. It's like that, that, that phrase that people say, I can go back to prison. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't been to prison, but I can, I've been broke. I, I hate it. Um, it's not the worst thing in the world, right? It's not the worst thing in the world, but it, it is terrible. Yeah. It is terrible. And yeah. since I've been in high pressure situations before uh, throughout my life, sometimes we're like, what's the worst that could happen? You know, you, you, you go broke, well, then you, you make more money. Yeah. You figure out, you know. Yeah. You just do something else. Just do something else. Also, coming at, at it from a mentality of what may be the worst that could happen is you never knowing. Yeah. You never knowing what would have happened had you not taken that risk. Yeah. To me, that's usually the worst. And so, yeah, with selling the home that we were in and almost ending up in a terrible rental for a long time, with leaving, I had a steady job. I had a steady job, and it was no issues uh, with, with that. I mean, comfortable, good paycheck, yeah. but leaving it, the same thing. Uh, these these have resulted definitely in lots of stress. So yeah. I mean, we paid for it in terms of stress, and, but it's been worth it yeah. for sure. Uh, I have to, we're, we're in the process of getting an, another in-town job again, but I've learned a lot yeah. in this period of time where I've just dedicated myself to farming full time. And I know I've learned a lot of what we need in terms of marketing, mm. in terms of what it really takes to do marketing. Yeah. What you're doing right now with, with, uh, with the YouTube is, is awesome. Yeah. So uh, the, types of different, the different types of ways that, that we uh, need to employ technology is already out there to spread the word of what we're trying to do. That insight is only gained by also jumping right in. And, yeah. And, and so. so you had uh, a full-time job before you did this. Your wife mentioned it earlier. You were a firefighter paramedic? Is yeah, right? I was. Originally, I was a firefighter paramedic. But okay. the job that I had right before coming to farm full-time, it was just a, strictly a paramedic job okay. in, uh, towards Atlanta. So let's see your chickens. So you've got this chicken house here. And this is one of your enterprises. Yes. Yes. How many chickens do you have? Are these layers? These are, yes, these are layers, air quotes layers. <laughs> uh, some of these, uh, these Easter eggers and, okay. and uh, olive eggers, they don't lay quite as much as your commercial layer, right. but they lay really pretty eggs. So, People pay more for pretty eggs. Isn't I, that interesting? I, I, I think they should. They I are prettier, they're you're right. They're great. Yeah. And, and why, you know, having something that, that is a little different, it's that it's not, let's say, uh, your commercial Isa Brown, right? You know, it, it's it's I think part and parcel of like the entire thing that we're trying to do, where it's not necessarily about the factory farm model; it's about the quality. So right. a, a hen that lays a pretty egg, but lays maybe 30, 40, or fifty less eggs a year, yeah. so be it. Yeah. yeah, I love that. So you've got them; they're in this house. Do they move at all, or do they just kind of stay here and roam free during the day? I was trying to do the regenerative model. At first, okay. with the chicken eggs, which is, I would be moving this house all around. That thing's heavy. It's heavy. Yeah. It's a pain in the butt to move. I just leave it here. Yeah. And I'm letting them free range. Yeah. They they still seem to get all of the nutrition that they need mm. in terms of just forages. They eat a lot of grass. I've, I've realized that, like even pigs, chickens, like they eat a lot of grass. And so the eggs, the egg yolks are still orange. Everything seems to be going pretty pretty good. Yeah, 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 that's awesome. You've decided, you've been on the farm for how long now, full time? About a year full time, okay. yeah, a little over a year full time. So you've done a lot of learning, a lot of immersion. You wanna call it like a deep immersion, pro immersion program. It. I mean, that's, that's exactly it. what you did here. And you're like, okay, it's time for me to go back, get a, get a W-2 job. What are you 
what are you looking for in a W-2 job and what really has made you make that decision? Okay, what has made me make that decision is learning how expensive marketing is. You can have the best products in the world, yeah. but if you can't drive the traffic to your products, if you cannot explain to someone why, why your pork is $8 a pound, versus the store bought pork at $4 a pound. That is, that is obviously a message that needs to be communicated. I don't want you to give me $8 a pound just because you like me. I want you to give me $8 a pound because you know that this is good, better for your health. It's better for the sustainability of your community, ecosystem, just a better product all the way around. So are you selling at farmer's markets right now or? Direct to like people okay. call me. People okay. call me and uh, sometimes they'll buy an animal live or yeah, so people just, just call me. I don't sell at a farmer's market. The cost of getting that message out to people who are looking for products like these. And for me, where I am where I am now, it seems to be not as much as people who are looking for it, but it's the cost of converting people to this side. The education piece exactly, of it. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It's not like, I think those of us getting into this, I think it'd be better if we just convert evangelize and convert people and educate people who yeah. otherwise don't know yeah it's more expensive whether it's a, a google pay-per-click advertisement instagram facebook advertisement billboards whatever it may be there's yeah. a there's a cost to that yeah and that is not something that i was uh, knowledgeable about i'm much more knowledgeable about it now well, that's one of the biggest reasons to go you know go back and and get a uh a W-2 job so that I can fund the marketing. Also, materials like yeah, <laughs> like the under like the the under fabric for this fence because all of this all of we put rock down it all disappear. Yeah, but just the uh, the fabric I believe to lay down for like gravel it's like a thousand dollars to continue to improve the farm. We want to do maybe a centropic type food forest we want to do a, like mm -hmm. commercial garden maybe that'll require yeah continual investment as well how did you emotionally come to this decision because if it were me and this is completely speaking of me i would be like dang like i failed i didn't do it right i'd be really hard on myself you seem to be like in a really good center good place with it did it take time to come to that did you have those emotions or did you just like know like hey this is just what needs to happen and we're just going to go do it Absolutely had those emotions. Okay. I knew that what I what what I do uh, is risky, uh, as we yeah. as we talked about before. So then, when I am sitting around feeling sorry for myself about the position, this is something my wife reminds me of all the time. You put yourself in this position. <laughs> That's a hard pill to swallow sometimes, isn't it? That's right. So yeah, I have to remember like this is you knew it was going to yeah you knew it was going to be like this uh you you get through it and then you're like oh well it's just another job like as a as a paramedic i could the good thing about that is there's no shortage of <laughs> work for paramedics not at all especially so, not in this day and age so rather than being upset that i i'm not let's say making six figures off of my farm that i started a year ago maybe it's the outlook needs to be completely the opposite is I need to count my blessings that I have a farm that is beautiful that is going that it's going to be even more beautiful when I put a food forest in let's say yeah uh, that is going to have uh, amazing quality uh, meat that I have the type of uh, credentials that allow me to pick up work at a moment's notice so there's yeah. there's just far too much to be uh, grateful about and and, and keep yeah. in mind we started as the goal was to just a homestead there's just far too much to be happy about and to be grateful about yeah for me to i think not have uh, a more positive outlook on what's going on i'm actually really yeah. excited there, there's been some other things uh that's happened we got a grant recently nice yeah. congratulations for the for SARE, uh, oh yeah, agriculture research, yes, or sustainable agriculture. Yeah, yep. We got a grant to do a project where we build topsoil here on this farm so that we can measure the soil respiration, which is yeah a metric that measures the amount of biology in in the soil. Uh huh. Right? 
And so w the reason why we are measuring soil respiration by building the topsoil, uh, and we're going to build it through the, some of the seeds that we're getting funded through the grant, is to correlate the soil respiration metric with increased nutrient density in beef. Uh, you, I see you already got it. Basically, the, the more life in the soil, the more nutrition in the beef. Is the theory. Is, and you're, you're working out there to prove is it. Is the theory. And, and, and we're going to work on that to prove we got the money to do it. So there's, there's great things happening. Yeah. We just need a little bit of time. Yeah. I love that. How did you um, decide what animals you wanted? You don't have a farming background. Um, you didn't grow up on a farm and you just immersed yourself in YouTube. So did you just get all of your education on the animals that you wanted from YouTube and other homesteaders and farm setters? Or was there like a mentor out there that you were able to contact with? How'd you get this information? I, I like really nerded out. So <laughs> there's so much info on YouTube. Yeah. So much. There's Joel, I've been watching Joel Salton for years, Justin Rhodes yep. for years, John from Grow Your Greens for mm -hmm. years. They're all converging on the importance of soil. In terms of the animals, I'm I was born in Cuba, so we're big on we're big on pig as pork as it is. I so, didn't know that. Yeah, we're big on pork as it is. Be well, and it makes sense. It's a a poor country. A pig is an animal that can handle a lot of. I'm just going to call it abuse. A pig is an animal that can handle. Uh, limited and scarce resources. Yeah, Let's they, put it they that way. there you go. Let's so they, they forage way. on, or they can forage, they can eat just scraps. Yeah, uh, in our contest in Cuba, be, coming from like the city environment and urban environment, you would put uh, a pen on your roof, a concrete pen on your roof, and that pig lives on concrete its whole life oh. and survives on whatever scraps you, you can forage for, for that animal. And, and still, in four months, five, six months, you have something that you could eat. And it's very important food source for a lot of impoverished people around the world because because it's harder to kill them <laughs> than uh, you can't you can't do that with a cow. You can't yeah, do that no. with with a goat. You can't do it with lamb. And in that, I think that's why pigs get a lot of bad rap, because historically they have survived uh, with people who didn't have many other options. You know, you say that and I have heard people say that. Uh, and maybe this won't go on camera, but I've heard people say that you don't, that they don't eat pork because it eats all the things you don't want to eat. So why would you eat it then? Because it's eating the bad stuff. And I've never quite understood that, but I guess coming from like an impoverished nation, that I guess that kind of makes sense. I, I understand that a little bit better now. I don't, I still don't agree with it, but I, I guess I understand that a little bit better. I hope this does go on camera. This is a big thing. That, and one of the hurdles that I've faced with marketing. When you give the animal options, the, you give uh, a, a hog options, they turn out to be so far the cleanest animal that I have on the farm. They go to the restroom opposite of where they eat. Mm. I can't say that for goats. I can't say mm. that for sheep. I can't say that for any, for any Cows, of these. Cows, chickens, rumen. nobody. They, they are the cleanest animal when given options. Do they root around in mud because they don't sweat? Yes, they, they root around in mud like a mask, when they, but they are away from their, their poop a lot of times. They won't eat close to it. They'll bed in a certain way. They, they're actually a very, very clean animal. Uh, in terms of what they eat, that's where I think the misconception comes from. Because uh, even if you go back to like England, if you get out of Cuba for a second, you go back to England, 18th, 1800s, like colonial 19th times. century. Yeah. Uh, earlier than that, the the peasant class was very, very, very poor, but they could get their hands on a pig, and sometimes feed it waste and like human waste. Human waste. When when there was nothing else, the pig wow. would survive on human waste, and that would be a food source for the family. I had no idea. So, yeah it's not fair to blame the animal for surviving because it's in it's in worse shape than the, what the family's in yeah but it will survive if you you cannot do that with uh lots of other animals or they would have but if you give them an option they're picky eaters they're not going to eat waste at all if you if you give them what they have here which is roots bugs grasses grains meat whatever they they they're, they're discerning eaters and they won't take to waste. It's kind of like humans almost. I mean, humans in impoverished areas eat what they can. 
and and they do survive. And I I think a lot about that with when we talk about how unhealthy diets can be just anywhere for humans. And then I I try to take a step back and I'm like, yeah, but like the human body's resilient and you're still reproducing on after eating those types of foods other species if you don't have you know a good nutrient a nutrient base they're not going to reproduce mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and humans are they're very resilient and so it, it seems like a lot of likeness with pigs being very resilient they're they're very 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 resilient i think that's that's why sometimes they get the the rap that they're this they're this animal that that's just an unclean animal. Yeah. I, I I do not see it at all. And in measuring the, with, I think with some of the analysis that have been done on the meat profile, again, when when giving the ability to forage, eat the chlorophyll in the grasses, the nutritional profile of the fat itself of the pig has a higher omega three mm. content, right? So it's going to be anti-inflammatory. It's going to be healing towards our body. So it's like everything else. If the animal is healthy, then the meat quality is going to be there. Yeah, there's a difference between very poor quality pork and very high quality pork. That is so interesting to me and I'm so glad we brought you brought that up because that is a conversation that's either really hard to have or just doesn't happen at all. And that kind of goes back to then your your marketing. You're trying to educate people. Are you said you don't go to farmers market. What kind of area is this for like a f- food base? Is this like a, a higher end area where people are going to Whole Foods or or wherever to buy, you know, expensive food at the grocery store, or is this like a lower area where people are just trying to get by? This is a good area, and I, I say that because I'm not gonna make excuses. I don't love the sell, the selling and the marketing side of things. I yeah. like the farming side of things. Yeah, most farmers. So <laughs> if I were to say that this is a bad area, I think it'd be very disrespectful to the farmers out there who are hustlers and would drive an hour hustlers in a good way or a bad way in a good way okay they drive okay. they they'll drive an hour because I, I live an hour 45 minutes from like atlanta there's lots of farmers who would love to be in the proximity that that i'm in to a major market yeah and all up around atlanta towards the north there's tons of those areas that you, that you already talk about where people do shop at whole foods or people already are looking for quality over over price and i i could be tapping into those areas yes and and we just haven't been uh applying those resources to that now granted it's been only mostly me and right? you've only been here a year only let's here reiterate here. that yeah. yeah and there's a real cost towards just the compliance side of driving meat needing a, a mobile meat license maybe a mobile refrigerator unit like there's oh, wow. costs there's costs associated with right it. but I would say that I live in a good area because I, I'm within an hour of major, major yeah. markets. Now, being in rural, rural land, like directly within the next like five minutes around me, these are, this is the country. Mm. And unfortunately, rural America is not known for, for having an abundance of resources. So it's very hard to sell anything that is more expensive here. To, to educate the your local community around here a little bit better on the type of and quality of product that they're getting. And that's why you haven't dove into that. And that's why you're kind of having that marketing issue. Is that right? Am I understanding that correctly? No, I just haven't done enough marketing work. Okay. I just haven't done enough marketing Well, okay, work. okay, hold on. I, I don't want to put you in a bad light. No, you, it, you are farming full time by yourself on 50 acres with four different species. And you've only been here a year. Yes. That's a lot yes. in itself. And to add marketing to it, that's a whole extra like yeah. full-time job. So Yeah, it is. It is it is it's a, a lot going job. on. That's that's something that 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 last part there that I didn't quite grasp getting into it. Like how much work is the marketing side of it? But I don't want to make excuses either. Like mm-hmm. it, it's just it has to be done. Whether my client my clientele base is more towards Atlanta or closer, that's, I'm fine either way. I just want to bring people into regenerative agriculture. Yeah. Uh, that's that's really our mission. You to, got bit by the bug and you want yes, to share it. Yes, so, and it may be that what saves rural communities 
is hopefully a, an awakening of people from the urban communities demanding to buy things directly from farms. Yeah. So it's it's just something that we're going to have to conquer with a little bit more time. Yeah, absolutely. So where are you kind of going next? You said you really want to get cattle. You're going to go work off farm for a little while to gain some extra capital and keep keep chugging along. But what do you think is next upon that? I would really like to for us to and I think other farms do as well, but focus on selling holes halves quarters. Ooh, why do you say that? Well, from a farming perspective, I've learned that that is much easier on the farmer. Yeah. Now, obviously, it has to be something that is great for the, the consumer. Right. And I think it, the only thing that is, you know, we're talking about maybe a little bit more freezer space. Yeah. But I don't see, given the, the, the uncertainty of everything that's happening in, in, yeah. at a greater scale, why you wouldn't if you have a family you wouldn't want to have a freezer stocked yeah. of meat so if you do then it's a rare opportunity where you can get your meat from a much higher quality source which is a small farmer and still save money and yeah. sometimes if you yeah. do go the quarters halves holes for instance if you're a family who, who eats let's say the equivalent of a half of a half of a of a cow a year if you were to buy from a farmer, you would still save, you would save some money. And if it's a grass finished operation where they're doing regenerative grazing, there's gonna be a lot more nutrition in that meat for you and your family. How do we change that mindset then? I mean, you're obviously still, you know, just in the beginnings of this, but even as a consumer yourself, how do we, how do we change that for people to understand where their money really is going long term? Is that part of that instant gratification thing, I wonder? I think it's definitely part of, of the instant gratification uh, that is pervasive in our society. But uh, there, there's definitely another side of, of things where there's lots of people who are chasing the opposite. Which one will win? I, I don't know. It, it, uh, it would help if our educational system uh, would touch on these concepts from an early age yeah. where it became second nature. Uh, what's happening a lot is a lot of people are learning about the ills of, of, of instant gratification to only approach food in terms of its perceived uh, affordability. And I think about it all the time. I'm sure you do too. Yeah. Like, what is it that's needed? I think that if I'm just going to be honest, the system, public school, the, the public education systems, even, even higher learning is, is such where consumers are almost being factory farmed. They're a marketable product all on their own. Yeah. It's not very conducive towards towards this conversation of hey, this is actually cheaper for you in the long run where a lot of people haven't begun to even explore uh, the 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 cost of uh, of cheap yeah. of cheap food. For instance, when I was in the fire department, I noticed that the majority of the guys is approached food only through the through the lens of of a deal whatever's mm -hmm. cheapest at the store on that day and that's i don't think that's something that's just recently been here i think that's probably something that's been here for decades as yeah. far as like we need to make food as cheap as possible yeah now with that getting into farming i've learned there were lots of players that were responsible for, let's say, bringing pork down to where it is. There, there's lots of players that are responsible for having beef prices be what they be. So if I'm gonna land the plane and get real, <laughs> a little bit specific and wrap up my point, there's a whole system in place to, to make food a commodity that's super, super cheap. Yeah. Lots of corners are cut and we, we're, we're destroying the environment. Well, we're in the middle of Oh, was it the fifth or sixth mass extinction event uh, due to the pesticides, due to all the corners that we're cutting to make food cheaper. And, and at the yeah. end of the day, it's it's not it's going to produce disease in, in us. I think from from elementary school on, we're trained to interface or interact with our food in, in terms of uh, 
the cheapest wins. Or like in passing almost. In pa being very disconnected yeah. from the process. And it's, by, it's, it's absolutely on purpose. Um, I think that they don't want us to know the details of how the prices w are what as low as they are because yeah. when you start to uncover those details you realize oh that's that's really really ugly that's really really bad that's really really toxic yeah and it there's so many examples uh, and, and so obviously they don't want you to know right? right with what you're doing with what will harris is doing when he appears on rogan which has a huge audience huge audience with the podcast people yeah. With all, with everyone that is saying, okay, they did what? They're doing what? They're labeling beef as product of the USA when it's coming from 17 other countries. Yeah, Brazil. See, <laughs> with information that we're produce, what we're providing, we are starting to turn the tide, and people are starting to realize, oh, I could pay for quality, hmm. or I could pay for something that's just toxic. So with you coming from more of a, a city area, um, that's kind of where you grew up and where you entered into your young adulthood, do you see other people also escaping the city to go and do farming or at least homesteading? I know obviously COVID was a big push and now it's kind of like we see, we're seeing a surge of people going back to the city, but are you still seeing that surge where you are? I hear a lot of people trying. It's really hard. I hear, I think from, well, I'm a millennial, I think you're as well. Mm -hmm. I, a lot of us that I speak with they say that would, they would love to, they would love to have something like this. I got this because I was able to profit on previous home sales. Right. This was like my, my third prop, property, right? Okay. So, and I was fortunate because I had to start young yeah. and, and bought a really small home when I was little and got a little bit bigger. And I, we were lucky or we were blessed how everything worked out in the end, but it was a series of other decisions that before that. Yeah. So for someone to land something like this on their first, uh, I guess as their first home, it might be a little bit more difficult. Yeah. I'm not saying impossible. And a lot of people say, I don't want something like this. I only want 10 acres. And I, I think you could do it, you know, especially yeah. like if it's a two income household maybe, or one, somebody has a good job maybe in tech, no, certainly. And if they're willing to maybe look 45 minutes or an hour out from, a, from the city. Yeah. Like, sure, I, I think you could do it, definitely. It just doesn't happen sometimes overnight. Sometimes yeah. it's like us and it's 10 years in the making of, we're like, well, if we stay in this home for two years or three years and we sell it, if the market's right, then we can get to another one. Mm -hmm. And we were always chasing this though. From the very beginning, we were always chasing ending up somewhere with with some land. So I'm like the oddball here, right? So I'm I'm, I'm coming in. I I don't have prior farming experience, and the people in this community have been doing it for generations. Mm. They have a certain way of doing things, and I've realized, I've realized that to just trust my gut. Yeah. Trust my gut. Uh, a lot of what they say won't work can work. Can work. Just keep following the advice from people who are, are operating more from a regenerative standpoint. So yeah, I, I, I tend to, to lean towards, it could work under the right, yeah. under the right approach. And, and I'm trying to follow the same thing with, with this grant. We're gonna try to put in soul builders with, oh. I would like daikon radish or yeah. things like that that are gonna go down and, yeah. and break up the pan. So speaking of like the farmers in this area, do you, have a good relationship with them or do, do does that do those conversations sometimes are they a little hard and I say that coming from a stance of myself so I'm a sixth generation farmer all conventional I went off and went regenerative moved to a town where nobody knew me personally they knew my husband and his family and we started doing things really crazy when we bought pigs and put them on pasture we had farmers no joke stopping on the road and yelling at me while I'm in the field what are you doing? I'm moving the pigs. Why do you have pigs out here? I don't know, they eat grass. No, they don't. Yes, they do. So how do those conversations go with, with the people around in your area? I've learned the hard way to trust the time that I've put into learning the regenerative principles. In the beginning, I put too much weight into so-and-so has been farming for 50 years. Yeah. Let me listen to what he says. Th that got me in trouble with the goats. 
How's that? Uh, <laughs> I never wanted goats to begin with. Okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to go straight into cattle uh -huh. because I'd seen how like Salatin moves his cattle or wool hairs. They, they uh -huh. move, they move their cattle, and and well, Salatin he's got the the pastured poultry going behind the cattle, yep. cleaning up. That's the model that I wanted to replicate, and I am I allowed myself to take advice from people who didn't who had no inkling of what regenerative agriculture was and or how it worked. Getting into goats was a tremendous ended up waste because they shouldn't have been on here to begin with mm. because the soil was just way too wet for. So they told you to goats. get goats. They were like, if I was you, they were like, cattle are too hard. You're brand new. Kind of like underestimating, right? You're brand new, you know, just why don't you just start with goats first? There's a great market for goats. Wrong, there's not, <laughs> at least I didn't find it there to be a great market for goats. It's a very niche market. And I should have just gotten into cows from to begin with. Uh, I like, I like the the sheep. The sheep are, they're pretty cool. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. If we can uh, find a real good market for, for sheep. But we're still, we're going to go back to where we started originally and, and get on with the cattle. And that kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier with like uh, the f the failure idea or like the fraudy feelings kind of thought where you're like, well, now I'm going to restart. But I personally have to remind myself too in those instances, it was still a learning experience. So do you think that kind of going back to the marketing side of things where you underestimated uh, the marketing side of farming, do you feel like that's kind of a tuition thing? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, I I agree with the, what you said, I mean, 100%. You're going to pay for it one way or the other. Whether You could pay for it the nice way and, and be like a 19, 20-year-old intern <laughs> and offer your a summer or two to work for a good program. That's yeah. probably the best way to pay for it Right. Right. with your time. But when you're like in your 30s already and, <laughs> and you have a family and you may have to have, you know, uh, a full-time job, then... You know, you're gonna you're gonna pay for it maybe another way by making more mistakes. Yeah. And mistakes are expensive. Yeah, they are. <laughs> so mistakes yeah, are cash heavy. <laughs> you're gonna or you could pay through it with if you can afford it with some consulting and that might be a a better way. Right. Or maybe the best way is to have a good relationship with a farmer who's doing exactly kinda like what you want to be to be yeah. doing. I've learned that maybe I I only well, maybe not only, but I need to put heavier stock into what the farmers that are doing what I'm wanting to be doing and what they say versus the conventional guys who, like you said, like with pigs, they think it's crazy that would have something that's like a, an acre to put them in. That's like, what would you waste that when you can put them all in like a tiny little stall and uh -huh. raise them that way? It's not what I want to raise. And then they yeah. scratch their head. I'm like, well, okay, you know, well, whatever. I'll try it. We'll no. see. <laughs> yeah. From their end, they're right. They're like, you, if you did it, they're thinking, if you did it your way, you're going to have to end up offering a certain amount. And they're, they're 100% right. right. Same with um, a lot of the cattle guys. It's, if we do it our way, it's going to take an extra six months to a year to finish a cow. So they're, they are 100% right. They're, yeah. they're, not, they're not dumb. And they don't, they don't mean well. They're trying to help. Yeah. It's just that they may not understand that the, the goal here is to develop a community that will pay yeah. the difference yeah and we're not necessarily trying to rely on a sale barn yeah so I think that transparency all comes back to like the marketing like you said is that what is what is your goal with the marketing you're still new you aren't here to give advice you're just here to share your story and to explain that like hey sometimes like it doesn't happen exactly the way we we want it to or I thought it was going to so what is your plan with the marketing? To do more like online marketing? Or I know some farmers get into like workshops and stuff. What do you want to do to like market your name and your farm? I like the idea of online marketing because it allows us to bypass a lot of gatekeepers. Some are, some are, are good, but even, even having to go through the process of applying for different uh, licenses and to, to join a farmer's market. Some farmers markets are like really restrictive or they already have their meat guy. Yeah. I kept hearing that. We already have our meat guy. We already have our meat I guy. Know. Right. So how do we do what we say we're going to do and empower small farmers and millennials to join into farming yeah. where every step of the way there is exclusion happening, really? Yeah. 
it's it's however hard or expensive you think it is it's much more expensive and, and much harder yeah. so i'm like you know what rather than relying on the okay from some farmers markets and it's not that you can't get it you can what i see what it was, reality is is a lot of times you that ain't gonna make it either right like you might need to join three do you have the time to join three to go do to you three? have the people to go to three if they're at the same time do you have right? the people to go to three do you have the want like can you go to three farmers markets load unload dedicate half of your week will you still like farming yeah after that i don't know if i would like farming too much I, I, had to do that, I think to that's a wonderful you. foresight because burnout is so easy when you're chasing something especially Oof. on farming boy and that to touch back into what you had asked earlier is probably one of the best reasons to say like why having an off-farm job job might be a great thing because it may in some situations prevent against burnout because if you didn't if you didn't make your revenue goal of let's say a thousand dollars a week you're not losing sleep about it you can still go on your farm and, and enjoy your farm yeah and that's something that i have have had to face is situations where we're like we've always wanted this and it's starting to be miserable. We've gotten close to it. Now we want to go the opposite direction. Yeah. Like, what can we do to where no matter what, we love this place? Yes. And that's very, very valuable. That's one reason why. If we prioritize online marketing through Instagram, Facebook, um, our website, driving traffic through our website, which involves search engine optimization strategies, analytics, costs and people are just calling us and be like hey can we go to your farm we kind of like what you do they come here they're like we want you to to grow farm a hog for us every year and maybe a quarter of a cow mm -hmm. that is where we think we're like that would be the best way to be yeah if we can just grow like take orders from people grow their animals for them deliver it to them educate them mm. We would love to do that. So we're trying to now, even if it takes us five years of marketing work right. to build up 20 families, right. 30 families, 40 families that want that. I think that will be like the happiest we would be Yeah. with our farm. I love that. Well, Daniel, thank you so very much for walking out here and just walking on your 50 acres and talking and learning about you and your farm. It just, this has been an amazing time and I really appreciate you taking time out of your Sunday to spend time with me and we'll share your message a little bit as much as we can. Thank you so, so much. Thank I appreciate you. it. Thanks.